Hello, Hypatia. And uh, I am very happy to be doing this for you again today. And um, due to recent eventualities, is that a word? I don't know. Um, <laughs> due to recent events, um, we can go back to Caves of God. I'm sure we are both happy with that. We have experimented with some difficult and unusual things. Um, so, we will carry on where we stopped, which in my edition is... Oh, it doesn't have page numbers, does it? Page 17? Yeah, page 17. It's a, a small chapter simply called The Architecture. Not the least incentive to legend-making is the knowledge that the cones and pleats of stone have, from an early time, been used for shelter, burial, and sanctuary. The tuff is easy to carve. As water and wind freed the larger shapes from sheets as thick as 4,500 feet in places, so human hands burrowed in for small, protective hollows to serve as homes for the living and the dead, and to ensconce divinity. The practice of scooping out an environment from natural features is a primeval one. At its simplest, advantage is taken of the hollows of the earth like natural caves. But often too, and in the most advanced of cultures, rural folk communities will make these hollows by cutting into natural matter. Usable shapes, sorry, by cutting into natural matter usable shapes, mostly hidden from view, which are the exact opposite of much architecture as we have come to know it. They stress not constructed form, built up in defiance of the laws of gravity, but rather a form that is dug, i.e. created with interior space as the main objective. Columns and vaults, when they exist, are no more than structural symbols, liberated from natural matter in the same way that a sculptor, sculptor liberates the human form from a slab of limestone or marble. To speak of the columns as, quote, holding up entab entablatures, or the, of the vaults as resting on walls, is only to demonstrate the tenacity of the traditional view of architecture, which centers on burdens and supports. Instances of this, sculpt this sculptured architecture, so to call it, are numerous, and the practice of making it and the practice of making it universal. Written sources record excavated uh, excavated environments that we have lost. Agathar, Aga, Agathachides, a Greek geographer of the third century BC, spoke of the rock dwellers of the Red Sea. Herodotus of Ethiopia and Xenophon of Armenia. In the vision of Obadiah, the Lord admonishes the land of Edom, Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation admonishes the land of Edom. Oh, no, sorry. Whose habitation is high. And the Quran in one of its several mentions of the wicked, city, the wicked city of Thamud, refers to its people as those who hewed out their dwellings among the rocks of the valley. But we have, of course, actual remains. Rock tombs abound in the Near East. Those of Petra in the south of Jordan are famous. In Sicily, 
Hone ta whole towns are rock, are rock cut. Siculiano, Caltabellotta, Raffadalle, Bronte, Maletto. Further and field in the Luce, excuse me, I don't know this word, L O E S S. I assume it's a kind of geological feature. Further afield, in the loose belt of China, a large area comprising the Honan, Shanxi, Shenzi, and Kanzu provinces, about 10 million people live in dwellings hollowed out of the silt that has been transported and piled up by the wind. The rock churches of Ethiopia, most notably those at Lalibela, were the subject of very recent books. When this anonymous architecture had its start in Cappadocia is hard to say. Of the thousands of burrowed spaces in the pliant tuff that have survived, few seem to antedate Christianity, and mature Christianity at that. But there is no reason to believe that this practice was more ancient. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm stupid me. There is no reason to disbelieve that the practice was more ancient. From the 7th century onwards, however, we have countless hermitages, monasteries, and independent chapels to prove that the land had become by then as holy as Mount Sinai or the desert of Sohag and one of the most concentrated regions of Eastern monasticism. There were also villages here and towns whose people chose to live apart from the small valleys and riversides in dim caverns carved in the native rock. This arrangement made architectural sense in the absence of wood and it had the advantage over constructed housing of being cool in the summer and rel relatively sheltered when formidable Anatolian winters came around. Wood was only used for doors and on occasion as flooring between superposed rooms. Two such towns are specifically mentioned in the first written record we possess on the rock-cut architecture of Cappadocia. They are Korama and Matianoi, the predecessors, in fact, of the present rock towns of Gureme and Machan, in a region where many of the churches we will be reviewing are to be found. These towns are referred to in the Acts of St. Hieron, a document which in its existing form dates from around 600 AD. But the actual martyrdom of this local saint took place during the Diocletianic persecutions at the end of the 3rd century AD. The existence of the two towns in the tough landscape could therefore probably be postulated for this early date. Hieron was a native of Mattia Mattianoi. He was arrested by Roman soldiers, together with 18 others, as he worked in the vineyards that comprised his regular occupation. He managed to escape from their hands, and after a pursuit through the fields, hid for a time in a mighty cavern in the flank of a hill which had been carved out of the rock with great skill. This account has topical credibility even today. The name of still a third town in the region, Hagios Prokopios, present-day Yurgyp, is referred to in relation to the Council of Chalcedon in 451. Among those attending was a certain Elpidius with the title of gosh, Memorophylax of Procopio and a contingent of other monks. Gosh, that's ten minutes already. There, it's dense, isn't it? There's a lot of information there. Really interesting. Um, all new to me. Um, goes from, I don't know, theories of architecture to <laughs> behavior of, uh, of monks in 
in summer and things like that. Endlessly fascinating. I will leave it there. Uh, I'm now on my page 42, I presume. It's hard to tell. I, I can't. But I'm on. I think I'm on page 42. Uh, I hope that was interesting for you, um, and I'd be delighted to carry on with it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.